Hey everybody, how's it going? Today we're going to be talking about some experimental World War II aircraft. Now the years before, during, and after World War II saw rapid evolution of aircraft technology. So to visualize this, I figured we'd start out and try to make a little timeline of aircraft technology. So if we start back in World War I, the biplane reigned supreme. During the war, monoplane aircraft were in their experimental phase, and for roughly the next decade or so, monoplane aircraft were rather rare and the biplane reigned supreme. By the late 20s and early 30s, monoplanes gained popularity with technological advances in engine technology and monoplane metal body aircraft started seeing more prevalence. By the mid-30s, countries like the United States and Soviet Union were now readily adopting monoplane aircraft. So we'll put the start point for the biplane sometime around the start of the First World War in 1914, just for simplicity's sake, and we'll go ahead and put the end point around 1936. Why did I choose 1936? Well, that's when the British-made fairy swordfish would see its initial production, a biplane that was considered basically technologically obsolete when it rolled off the production line. While it would find some surprising success during the war, it does effectively mark the end of biplanes in major military roles, giving way for monoplanes to take full control. In the next few years, monoplane aircraft would quickly evolve due to the rapid evolution of aircraft engines, making new aircraft faster by the year. Monoplane aircraft from the late 30s were often easily outclassed by aircraft from just a year or two later. In 1941, Germany began testing on what would be the first mass-produced rocket-powered aircraft with the ME-163 Comet, which would enter the war officially in 1944. Later, in 1942, Germany began testing on the ME-262, which would enter the war in 1944 as well, as the first jet-powered fighter. So basically, from the end of 1936 to 1944, a span of about eight years there, aircraft went from the end of the biplane era to the beginning of the jet propulsion era. It was a time of rapid advancement and experimentation. A small part of this experimentation is what I want to look at today, centered around the U.S. Army Air Corps' request R-40C, made on November 27, 1939. In this request, they asked for new aircraft designs with a few basic requirements. It had to be a single-engine, single-seat plane with four guns minimum. It had to be able to take off from a 3,000-foot grass field, that was surrounded by 50-foot obstacles at various intervals, and it had to fly at around 425 miles an hour or more at an altitude of around 15,000 feet. They also sought overall increased performance when compared to standard fighters and overall increased pilot visibility. Everything else was left to the discretion of the designers. And, as it would turn out, the three aircraft that would see significant consideration from the U.S. military, the XP-54, XP-55, and XP-56, all had a common strange factor to them. They were so-called pusher planes. A pusher plane, simply put, is one where the propeller is located behind the engine. The more standard configuration is known as a tractor. For the XP series of planes, they are all pushers, with the engine being located in the tail or at least the rear of the fuselage. While it does look strange for a propeller plane to have the propeller located at the back instead of the front, it has been used successfully and currently does see limited use today. It sees current use more casually on little personal gliders and sees military use on drones and various light aircraft. With all that being said, let's go ahead and look at each aircraft, and look at how they were designed, and how they performed, and why they inevitably failed to get off the ground. We'll go in sequential order and start with the Volti XP-54 Swoos Goose. Made by the Volti Aircraft Company, the XP-54 officially began its short career on January 8, 1941, after a contract for a prototype was awarded after wind tunnel testing proved successful. 
The XP-54 featured a pusher-style engine located at the end of the fuselage with a twin-boom tail helping to balance the weight of the aircraft. The propeller itself was of the contra-rotating variety, meaning it had two propellers that spun in opposite directions. The wings were bent into obtuse angles, making them what is called inverted gull wings. This can be done to help shorten the length of the landing gear, making them more stable, and can reduce drag due to how the wings are connected to the fuselage. The wings would also contain the cooling systems that were needed for the engine. The XP-54 also had two rather unique features. It had a fully pressurized cockpit, with the seat acting as an elevator, with the seat lowering from the plane to allow the pilot to sit in and rise into position. The more interesting feature was that the nose of the plane could move vertically, 3 degrees up and 6 degrees down. This gave the pilot the ability to slightly adjust his aim without having to change the plane's altitude or position. The plane was outfitted with two 37mm cannons and two 50 caliber machine guns. Finally, the XP-54 was to be powered by a prototype Pratt & Whitney X-1800 engine. However, after that engine's production was halted, the prototype Lycoming XH-2470 was used instead. As for the XP-54's actual performance and career, it was fraught with delays and overall lackluster performance. First, as mentioned before, the original X-1800 engine was cancelled, which meant that the designers needed to scramble for a new engine that hopefully wouldn't alter their overall design too much. The XH-2470 was selected, but it was slightly heavier and larger overall, and it also caused the designers to switch from a contra-rotating propeller to a single propeller. Additional changes to the armaments were made, and this increased the weight of the XP-54 even more. So, when it finally went for a test flight on January 15, 1943, over two years after the original contract was approved, the flight was successful, but disappointing. The XP-54 was slower than anticipated and suffered some engine trouble, both at high altitudes and high RPMs, where some liquid would start foaming in it, which is very not good for an engine. In what would effectively end the XP-54, this engine was found to be damaged late in 1943, and the military elected not to conduct the repairs due to the cost. After this, more test flights were conducted with the XH-2470 engine, which was still a bit beaten up, and an additional supercharger. But after these broke down even further, a replacement engine was found and used until April 2nd, 1945, when that engine also failed in a test. This would inevitably be the final flight of the XP-54, and the project was over. Moving on to the next one, we have the Curtis Wright XP-55 Ascender. Made by the Curtis Wright Corporation, the XP-55 began its short career more than a year later than the 54, on July 10, 1942, after extensive, although mediocre, testing led to a design the Air Corps was interested in. The XP-55 also featured a pusher-style engine, this time located at the very tail of the plane. The overall design concept was of the canard variety, where a smaller set of wings are in front of the main wings. The smaller wings, located on the nose, would control the vertical movement. The main V-shaped wings included vertical fins on the ends added for stability. The plane was outfitted with four 50 caliber machine guns, and like the XP-54, the XP-55 was to be powered by the X-1800 engine, but after it was cancelled, of course, the Allison V-1710 was used instead. And also like the XP-54, its career was fraught with delays, lackluster performance, and eventual disastrous failure. Since the X-1800 was cancelled and the V-1710 was used instead, this immediately decreased the horsepower by almost half, which certainly would complicate the design process and make it more difficult to reach the specifications required. On its first test flight on July 19, 1943, it was found that it took far too long to actually take off the ground, so the nose wings immediately had to be adjusted and increased in size. 
Later on, in November 1943, the XP-55, during a stall test, inverted and began falling in such a manner that the pilot could not regain control. The pilot managed to eject and survived, but the plane crashed and did not survive. Testing would continue, however, and two more craft would be made, with one beginning testing on January 9, 1944, and the other on April 25, 1944. However, the overall performance of the craft was found to be inferior to the more conventional aircraft that the military already used, and on April 21st, 1945, testing on the XP-55 was officially finished. A month later, on May 27th, 1945, one of the remaining two craft was destroyed when it crashed during an air show at Wright Field in Ohio. Unfortunately, the pilot and four civilians were killed in this crash. Finally, let's look at the last one, the Northrop XP-56 Black Bullet, probably my favorite because of its shape. Made by the Northrop Corporation, the XP-56 began its career in 1941, as the Army requested a prototype be delivered by September 26, 1941. The XP-56 had a contra-rotating propeller located on the tail of the craft. The overall design was supposed to be a flying wing of sorts, with a tiny fuselage, regular gull wings, and only a minimal vertical tail. The body was also to be made of magnesium instead of aluminum, as aluminum was in rather short supply due to the war effort and magnesium metal was much lighter. It was outfitted with two 20mm cannons and four 50 caliber machine guns. The XP-56, like the other two, was also to use the X-1800 engine, but the Pratt & Whitney R-2800 was used instead. As was a common issue with this little series of aircraft, its career was filled with delays and poor performance. The replacement engine, the R-2800, was more powerful than the X-1800, but it was also heavier and larger, which led to an overall weight increase of about 2,000 pounds. Additionally, the magnesium frame caused significant delays, as standard welding techniques would not work on the metal. So, Northrop decided to hire someone to develop a way of easily welding magnesium. Unbeknownst to the military, however, was that General Electric already developed a technique to weld magnesium sometime in the 1920s, so this ended up being a completely unnecessary delay. Initial prototype testing would not begin until March 1943, when an engine issue delayed flight testing by an additional five months. In the meantime, testing on the ground showed that the tiny vertical tail that it had to be completely ineffective which led to yaw control problems. This led them to install a more standard, taller vertical tail. During a test on October 8, 1943, a tire blew out on takeoff at around 130 miles an hour. The pilot would miraculously survive, but the aircraft itself was destroyed. A second prototype was made and began testing on March 23, 1944 but this one showed the same yaw control issues of the first one, despite now having a properly sized vertical tail. Overall performance and flight speed was also found to be much lower than was expected, and by August 1944, flight testing was officially ended. This led to the project being inactive for over a year, which meant that it was officially cancelled as a result. With all that being said, there are two little final things we need to examine here. We now know that the design process of each of these craft was fraught with delays and equipment issues, and we know that the initial prototype test results were less than satisfactory in that they underperform when compared to their more conventional counterparts. The questions that remain are thus. Why were they all pusher planes, and why were the projects axed instead of recalibrating and retesting with different technology? On the first question, we don't really have a definitive answer, but my assumption is that because they wanted improved pilot visibility, they went with the pusher design to give the cockpit and the pilot a clear view, free from the obstruction that the propeller would normally cause. For the second question, we have to recall the little timeline of aircraft technology we made at the beginning. Now, recall how all three projects were officially canceled by 1945. Basically, with the beginning of jet propulsion testing and the jet propulsion era of aircraft in 1944, the designs and 
By extension, their propeller propulsion systems were now outdated. There was no real point in continuing prototype testing of propeller-powered fighters with jet power fighters, showing much more initial promise and better performance. With the Lockheed P-80 Shooting Star jet fighter, for example, which would be adopted by the military in 1945, first flying on January 8, 1944, and reaching speeds of almost 600 miles an hour, there was simply no need to continue the three propeller aircraft. Simply put, the XP-54, 55, and 56 were foiled by two main things, project delays and the rapid advancement of aircraft technology. All right, and I think that's where we'll stop for now. I hope you enjoyed the video, and remember to like, comment, and subscribe. If you feel like it, maybe check out some of my other videos. You might like them, you might not. There's only one way to find out, and that's to watch them in full 15 times in a row without blinking or moving. I hope you tune in for my next video, and I at least hope you learned something from this video. See ya.